All right, here's problem eight for the math subject GRE practice exam. Uh, in this problem, we get into group theory, so kind of a different topic than we've seen so far. And so what you're asked is which of the following is not a group. And so what you need to know are the axioms uh, that make a set a group. And so those axioms are closure, associativity, um, and identity element, and an inverse element, or I guess every element needs an inverse element. So what I'm going to do is talk about each of these four things for each of these five listed sets, A, B, C, D, and E, and we'll see which one fails and why the rest do not fail. Uh, so closure, the basic idea behind closure, the closure of a set under a, an operation is if you take two elements in that set and combine them under your operation, then you're guaranteed to get a third element in that set. So what I'm saying is if you take two integers and you add them together, is, are you guaranteed to get an integer? Like, is there any way you can get like a fraction or something? No, you add an integer um, with another integer, a whole number and another whole number, whether it's positive or negative, you're guaranteed to get a whole number. Uh, we do get closure here. Give you a Y, sure. The non-zero integers under multiplication. So if you multiply together two integers, are you guaranteed to get an integer? Yeah. Um, and if you limit yourself to the non-zero ones, sure, you're guaranteed to get a non-zero one. I'll throw a Y right there. The non-zero real numbers under multiplication, yes, by the same logic, right? You take a real number, you multiply it by another real number, you'll get a third real number. And if those first two are non-zero, your third one will be non-zero. What about the complex numbers under addition? Sure, the sum of two complex numbers is another complex number. A plus BI plus C plus DI is equal to A plus C plus C plus D times I. Anyways, uh, you add together two complex numbers, you're guaranteed to get a complex number, so you put a yes here. The non-zero complex numbers under multiplication. Yeah, that ends up being true. Turns out that if you multiply together two complex numbers that are not zero, you'll get another complex number, which itself is not zero. Um, I imagine that that would be the one that people would struggle with the most. Uh, when you're multiplying together complex numbers, I think the easiest way to think about it is geometrically, not algebraically. And so if you think about it geometrically, any complex number I can graph on the complex plane. So if the real part goes here, it's imaginary part here. So like three plus two i, I can graph it right here. I can think about it as this vector that gets me from here to here. Uh, so if I'm multiplying together two complex numbers, so let's pick another one, I don't know, one plus four i, fine, this guy right here. The way I can multiply those guys together is if I think about them as vectors, I do two things. I add the angles that define those vectors. So I got this angle and this angle. And if I add those guys together, I get some other angle. Maybe it brings me over here somewhere. I don't know exactly where it would be. And then you multiply the magnitude. You figure out how long this line is right here. So I don't know exactly how long it is. Um, and then you figure out how long this line is right here. And then you multiply those two numbers together and that'll tell you how long your next line will be. So I do all that work and I end up with some new vector somewhere out here. I don't know exactly where it'd be. Um, but the point is, it would be a complex number because it shows up in this plane and it would not be zero because the way I would get to zero, the only way I can get to zero is if the product of the two magnitudes, the length of these vectors is zero. And the only way you can multiply together numbers and get zeros if one of those vectors is zero. So the only way I can end up with zero in a multiplication of complex numbers problem is if one of those two numbers is itself zero and the set I'm talking about is the non-zero complex numbers. Anyways, that's a long explanation to show why this does give us closure in this set E. But I think having this to rely on might help us figure out some other ones. Associativity. Um, addition's associative, whether you're dealing with integers or um, real numbers or complex numbers or anything else. And so is multiplication. So I can kind of skip through this real quick. Um, integers, addition, sure, that's associative. Non-zero integers under multiplication, sure, that's associative. Non-zero real numbers under multiplication, yep. Complex numbers under addition, yeah, no problem. Uh, the non-zero complex numbers under multiplication, yep, that works. And you could go through and show that, like A times B times C is equal to A times B times C. Um, but I think it's fairly obvious in each of these cases, so I'm just going to say why. Uh, identity. So we need one element in each of these sets that is what's called the identity element. Often you use the letter E to denote it. 
And the idea with the identity element is if you take any element from your set, so I'll call it A, and you combine it with your identity element, and it does not matter what order you combine it with, and I don't know what your operation is, so I'll put this little star, I don't know if it's addition or multiplication or what. But if you do that in either case, what you will get is that element. And that has to be true for every element in the set. So if I take any integer I want, is there some magical integer out there that when I add it to that integer, regardless of what size I'm on, I'll leave the integer alone? Yeah, zero, right? Four plus zero is the same as zero plus four, which is four. Um, so yes, there is an identity element. It happens to be the number zero. I'll put a zero right there. Um, what about the non-zero integers under multiplication? Is there some special non-zero integer that I can multiply any other integer by and not change its value? Yeah, the number one. One times anything is that anything. The non-zero real numbers under multiplication, yep, still one. The complex numbers under addition, yep, the number zero, or zero plus zero i, if you really wanna think about it that way. The non-zero complex numbers under multiplication, yes, one will work, one plus zero i. The way you can talk yourself into that is if you, well, maybe it's obvious from thinking about it algebraically, but geometrically, if you talked about this vector that goes to right here, the magnitude of this vector is one and the angle is zero. So when I go through the steps I talked about for multiplication, it wouldn't change any vector that I have. Okay, so so far, any of these sets with the operation given um, would qualify as a group. So our, our last axiom that we have to consider is the inverse axiom. And the idea for the inverse axiom is that any element in the group, for any element in the group, so if I'm letting A represent an arbitrary element in my group, there must be some other element, maybe I call it B, such that regardless of which way you combine these two things, you get back to your identity element. So it's good that we made note of our identity element here because we'll have to think about that when we're answering our inverse. So the integers under addition. My question is, can you start out with any integer you want? For anyone you want, is there a, another integer that when you combine the two of those in either order, We'll get you back to zero. And sure there is. I mean, pick your favorite number, seven. I'll give you the inverse, it's negative seven. So yes here, it's just the negative of the element. Uh, what about the non-zero integers under multiplication? Turns out there's not. Why not? Well, remember our identity element here is one. So the idea is, can you start with, for any element that you start with, is there another element that'll get you back to zero? So what if I start with eight? Is there a number that I can multiply eight by to get me back to, sorry, not zero, one? Is there a number I can multiply eight by to get me back to one? Well, sure, one eighth, but the problem is one eighth is not in this set because this set only includes non-zero integers and one eighth is not an integer. So eight is an element that does not have an inverse element. So therefore my inverse axiom fails here for B and the answer to this question will be B. And I'm not that special about eight. That'll be true for any element in this set other than the identity element itself that the inverse element will not exist in this set. I'll go through an answer, show you why the other three are yes here, just because I'm here. Um, but I guess at this point, you've answered the question and you're moving on. For C, the complex, no, the non-zero real numbers under multiplication. Well, now the answer is yes. You can kind of use the same logic as before. Start out with any number you want. Can you get back to one? Well, sure, just the reciprocal of that number. So eight, one eighth would work. And one eighth is in my set now because I have real numbers, not just integers. Pi, one over pi will work. Root two, one over root two will work. Negative 17, negative one seventeenth will work. Anyways, you get a yes here. What about the complex numbers under addition? Well, remember that our identity element there was zero. So if you start out with any complex number, here, three plus two i, I'll pick on that one again. Is there some other complex number that I can add to that number to get me back to zero? Well, yeah, there is a negative of that. So instead of three plus two i, negative three minus two i would get me to zero plus zero i, aka zero, aka my identity element. So we get a yes there. Finally, the non-zero complex numbers under multiplication. Well, it turns out that's yes also, although I think that's the hardest one to talk yourself into. If I start out with an arbitrary complex number, so three plus two i, for example, is there some other complex number that I can multiply this complex number by to get me back to one right here? Well, it turns out there is, and you can prove that algebraically, but I think it's easier to show that geometrically. Uh, so remember, the way that you multiply together complex numbers is you first add their angles 
So I got this angle here. I want some other angle that'll take me back to zero because this is where my identity element lies. So let's pick this angle down here. Right, if you add up this angle and that angle, you get this angle, 360, or this plus this negative value gets me back to zero. And now I gotta pick a length, so I'm, I wanna pick a length so that when I multiply this length by this length, I get exactly one. So just pick some really short length right here. Determine what this length is. Maybe this length is five, I don't know what the hell it is. Um, then make this length one fifth. Fine, you've just defined a complex number that when I multiply it by this original vector, I get this number one right here. So yes, in fact, every element in this set does have an inverse element. And so my answer would be yes. And I guess that would answer this question, so I'll stop here.